Telecast. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby and welcome to another Telecast. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be exploring the world of YouTube for TV producers with our friends at Little Dot Studios. The current commissioning slowdown has highlighted how exposed producers can become to global economic headwinds. When the networks and streamers stop buying, it can leave many indies high and dry, which is what we're seeing right now. So perhaps now is the time to properly consider building a different kind of indie. One where building your own IP through podcasts, YouTube and other social networks are the keys to a more sustainable future. Well, here to discuss the practicalities and opportunities in YouTube is James Loveridge, Managing Director of Entertainment at Little Dot Studios. Welcome to Telecast, James. You all right? Yeah, good. Hello. Thank you for coming on the show. So you're going to help demystify YouTube for us, for, for, for the... For the YouTube skeptics out there, because I know there's a lot of them and there's a slight amount of perhaps misunderstanding still exists within the more traditional areas of the TV industry. And we're going to plunge a little bit into self-publishing and self-commissioning. So first of all, tell us about your role a little dot, what you do and who you do it for. Sure. So I'm Managing Director of Entertainment at Little Dot. So I oversee a team of about 110 editors, account managers, insights analysts, graphic designers, and all kind of manner of skill sets. So essentially, we work uh, white label for IP holders, be they broadcasters, SVOD platforms, independent production companies, talent distributors. And essentially, we do a multi-service offering running channel management, paid media amplification, direct ad sales, copyright management for these rights holders across a multitude of different social platforms. So YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter slash X, Snapchat. If it's got social video, we operate there. So our kind of main aim is to try and help our partners kind of realize the potential in their IP, be it revenue generation or brand affinity or audience reach or whatever it may be. Uh, our aim is to help them just kind of maximize the value of that across social video. And and this, you know, some of that sounds a little bit daunting, I suppose, because <laughs> there's so many ways into it and so many reasons to be involved in YouTube. But, you know, perhaps some of the producers are more reticent to, to put their content onto YouTube and and really stay on the traditional path, which is waiting for the commission from, you know, the Channel 4s and the ITVs and the BBCs of the world, in the UK anyway. You know, it's becoming a little bit of a crunch time, I think, for many. And I think there's there's quite a few myths around YouTube in terms of, you know, what sort of content works on there, how long the content is, and also how many views you need to get to make meaningful revenue. So let's let's just talk about the broadcasters and rights holders that you currently represent. How is working on YouTube specifically, benefiting them? I suppose we've worked on YouTube for over kind of over a decade and the perception of that platform has changed massively over that time. I think 10 years ago when we were talking to production companies and saying we could look at YouTube, it was very much cat videos and skateboards and all of that, you know, kind of very heavily influencer-led content and wasn't taken very seriously. I think because of that, we were able to actually get quite a lot of free reign to kind of experiment on the platform because no one was really caring what we were doing in terms of, you know, fine, clip it out, put it out there. But the perception of YouTube has evolved massively. I think as a platform themselves, they have pivoted from being a social kind of platform centric to being more of a streamer and kind of competing with the likes of Netflix and Prime Video and and other kind of SVOD and AVOD platforms out there. I think in terms of how we help IP owners and broadcasters, the kind of core thing we do is like understand what their KPIs are. I'd say that about 80% of the partners that I work with, their core KPI is monetization. How do I realize the revenue that, you know, from my IP? And then I'd say the other 20% is kind of marketing centric, audience acquisition, building a brand and and how they then convert that into a funnel, be it to an SVOD or direct to purchase, or if it's just about reaching younger audiences that they can't reach on other platforms. So I think the, the, complex kind of nature of different kind of KPIs means that, you know, you have different strategies for different IPs and different approaches. But I think the good thing about YouTube specifically is the malleability of the of the product and the platform. You can, you know, aim for long form for much older audiences. You can be doing short form for younger audiences, whatever those kind of KPIs can be serviced through that platform. So in terms of how we help kind of those IP holders and broadcasters. So I think it's fully understanding what it is they're trying to achieve and how do we kind of build a custom-made strategy to help service that kind of KPI, really. Yeah. So, well, let's start at the very beginning looking at YouTube. So 
It's the world's second biggest website, essentially. Yeah. That's probably a good, good starting point, right? <laughs> Obviously owned by Google, which is the world's number one. And search is something that is extremely powerful when it comes to content discovery on both of those platforms. Let's, let's talk about the, these myths then in terms of what's working on YouTube now more than ever before. And we've seen recently Mr. Beast has actually started to extend the length of his content. And he's finding that, you know, watch time is an incredibly important metric, perhaps more so than subscribers. Is that is that right? Tell, tell us about, you know, the playoff between watch time and subscribers. Yeah. So I, whenever I talk to kind of new potential clients and partners, stuff like that, I, I very early on say that subscribers are a vanity metric. It's nice to point at. You can get a nice silver or golden or if you're very successful, diamond button. But it's just something to point at. It doesn't actually really quantify value. I would say the value is the watch time, the engagements, the return viewers, the momentum that you're building within the algorithm. Because you've got channels with millions and millions of subscribers that are uploading videos getting tens of thousands of views. You could have a video, a channel with a handful of subscribers getting millions of views. Which one is more valuable to the to the uploader? So definitely, I think subscribers are a nice to have, but I would say they're a, a consequence, not a cause. Watch time is definitely a core focus. I think it's been really interesting over the last couple of years. YouTube and Meta were fairly unfazed in terms of like evolving their product for quite a, a long period of time. And then TikTok came along as such a disruptor into the market where you know they had such phenomenal growth and it was very much short form centric and very quick disposable content that as a reaction, reels and shorts were released. So everybody talked about social video in purely vertical short form mindset. And for a large swathe of people that are consuming it, that is how they consume social content. And that is, you know, an indisputable fact, especially Meta's kind of pivoting to reels as a primary video product. What we found over that kind of two year period, in the, over the last two years with YouTube is they lent heavily into shorts, but it's not matured as a monetizable product as well as say their longer form. So you could get millions and millions of views, but they wouldn't be worth anything near the kind of viewing and RPMs that you'd get on a normal video. So weirdly, you've got these two kind of parallel ecosystems and audiences and behaviors where you do have these short form kind of uh, pockets where people consume short videos and might get millions and millions of views. But realistically on the non-shorts product, the longer content is dominating. Because ultimately, YouTube does want to be a streamer. They, you know, the longer people are engaged with the content and the longer they stay at their destination, the more engaging and more valuable that content is for YouTube as a platform. So we've definitely seen a pivot towards longer content being more dominant algorithmically, but also with the kind of rise of connected TV, like in terms of fast viewing, which obviously fast has been the big buzzword within TV for the last kind of 12, 18 months. YouTube makes up 50% of all fast consumption in the US. So it's it's a dominant player in that space and they want to keep people on the platform for as long as possible. So your full episodes, your multi-episode compilations, that is the stuff that not only are the platforms pushing, but the audiences consume and are like viewing behaviors lean into that. So you've got these kind of two separate ecosystems that have evolved on the, the ultra short form and the, and the super long form. And people don't normally think about YouTube as a fast channel, really, do they? It's always left out of that conversation everyone thinks about samsung tv plus but actually the same you know this the fact it's app based on your tv on your uh, tv interface and and we know that more and more people as you say are watching watching youtube on their tv as opposed to just watching it on their handset yeah and, it, and it's fascinating the kind of when you look back at the data and the audience demographics of the people that are consuming it connected tvs is the fastest growing device on the platform still mobile phone is is i would say the most dominant device that people consume YouTube on, but connected TVs is rising up the rankings. And what's interesting about it is the value of the advertising around views on connected TV is far greater than that on mobile. So if your kind of main goal is to realize the revenue potential in your content, understanding how to get it in front of people that are watching on connected TV and sticking around for longer is by far the fastest and most effective way to make the most money possible. And it's interesting what you say there about multi-episode compilations. So if you've got a series, a 10-part series, for example, a documentary series, you can you can put those on as a series onto YouTube, obviously, and, and either over a sequence of period of time or upload them all together. We can maybe talk about that, the, the right way to do that in a, in a second. But the multi-episode compilations of putting, I don't know, four hours together or five, two, maybe two five-hour shows is becoming more and more 
popular, isn't it? And, and and delivering more, as you say, when it comes to advertising revenue. So is is that something that you're doing as well for your yeah. clients? Yeah. So quite interestingly, I'd say about like five, six years ago, we had to operate within promotional clip usage rights. Most people, because YouTube wasn't seen as a central focus, if we were dealing with shows that are on TV, obviously the broadcaster will give you a limited clip usage. So our view was, okay, so how do we make the most of these clips? You kind of pick all the kind of key moments, the things that are going to drive engagement. But we knew that actually you might have multiple kind of four minute clips, but if you made a thematic compilation that was 12 minutes long, that was going to do well, like in even better because of the algorithmic preference to push the longer content. Now with full episodes, we're doing that just on a much larger scale. So we've got some instances where there may be, you know, for instance, Cops, we work with Langley Productions that makes uh, the TV show Cops. We'll have full length episodes, but also we could stitch them together that all of the Florida cases and all of the, you know, crazy arrests and things like that. And so you can either do it sequentially in the way that it broadcasts. You can do it thematically where actually they're based in states or they're based on types of crimes or, you know, and there's ways of looking at catalogs and uh, an archive and making a whole different way of packaging it. One of our other partners, New Dominion, who have similar kind of true crime FBI files and new detectives, we've completely changed the way in which that's been packaged and distributed digitally. And now it's got a whole new audience and and kind of build real momentum around these kind of mega compilations and new ways of packaging it. So YouTube is getting bigger. Mm. More and more people are watching YouTube. Is it too late for producers now? Is it too much competition? Because the there's content creators, there are, you know, so many different producers and content creators and broadcasters putting content up there, and the content is getting more higher and higher quality, TV quality. Is it too late? Is it too late to start to build a, a community? Because it seems to be so much competition, it's very difficult to get any traction. Yeah, thankfully, no, it's not too late. What I would say is that Understanding what it is you're trying to achieve will help you decide what the best way to approach it is. If you're trying to build up a brand awareness and it's actually more important that you've got brand affinity and an audience that you're building on that may then lead and funnel on something else, then you can utilize short form shorts on uh, YouTube and then reels on Facebook and TikTok itself. You know, these are all ways to kind of do fast cut through and you don't need a, a pre-existing momentum and, and algorithmic kind of presence to really punch through. That's a way of doing it. What we also have found is that YouTube doesn't want to just have it be a location of legacy stuff that's just sitting there forever. Like it's starting to, for want of a better expression, tank older successful videos to surface new content, new creators, new uploaders, stuff like that. And as a result, part of our strategy is sometimes we're looking at let's launch multiple channels, multiple iterations of a certain show to help kind of build different different locations for it that are reaching slightly different audiences. It could be packaged to each, you know, much older demographics, or it can be packaged to be very humorous and meme heavy in terms of its package um, optimization to reach younger audiences, but it could be the same content, just packaged in two very different ways. So I wouldn't say that it's too late. What I would say is kind of understanding what it is that you're hoping to achieve, because it can seem overwhelming. There is so much to do. And I think with YouTube specifically, you know, it's not just a video platform. Yes, they're pivoting from social to uh, to a streamer, but there are the social elements of it. There are comment sections, community sections. There's opportunities to kind of create interaction polls and clickable links and all of those types of things. So there's loads of different ways that you can interact with the community. And it shouldn't be just one-way traffic. You shouldn't just be posting it, setting and forgetting. You're trying to culture, uh, build a culture and community. And so the key thing to that is understanding who's consuming your content, what they kind of like. I often talk about trying to understand kind of two languages. One of the algorithm, how do you get your content served? And one of the audience, like how do people want to consume it? What do they want to consume? And if you can kind of get those two correct, then you start building serious momentum. And is a niche content better or worse for revenue generation? That's a, that's a tough one to answer because it can definitely help you find an audience. We have, as well as working white label for IP owners, we have our owned and operated network of over 50 channels across YouTube. And it started out that we were doing digital rights management for distributors that had vast catalogs of factual content. We started to see the demand for it. So then we made a destination, a hub, where we licensed that long form and put it out there. Started out with generic documentaries, and then we realized actually history does really well. So we had Timeline, which is our history one. And then we realized, you know what? 
there are these niches. So now there's Chronicle, which is all medieval history. There's War Stories, which is World War II history. And then you can drill down into those niches. Now that content can live in multiple places. Those people that are just generic, want to find something long form interesting to, to watch, might come to the more generic hub. But those that are absolutely obsessive about Rommel, they're going to go to War Stories. So it's just that kind of thing of like, understanding who it is you're trying to reach and, and what kind of impact you're trying to have. So I think niche has its benefits. I think you can definitely drive much more meaningful engagement. If you if you find a core audience and you're feeding them what they want, then they will comment, they will like, they will become real advocates for your brand, for your IP. And that in, in of itself drives that kind of algorithm performance. But then also if you're going too niche, you might not put in the correct kind of optimization tags, metadata titles that would reach that broader audience that would equally enjoy it. They just don't know about it. So it's trying to find that balance. And I think one of the things that we're constantly doing is assessing performance over kind of periods of time. And actually, is that title right? Is that metadata right? Are we too niche, too broad? How do we make sure we're hitting the right kind of spectrum of people? And this is something that I've, I've learned over the last two months once we've launched our YouTube channel on Telecast. And the metadata and tags, hashtags, the amount of information they actually put in your description, your title, your thumbnail, yeah, all of this stuff, it seems slightly overwhelming to begin with. But it is just a new skill set that if you're a content creator putting your content onto YouTube, you've got to learn. Because as you say, it's about discoverability and building audiences. And So when it comes to new skill sets that... Uh, a producer, for example, who's who's there, they've got a catalogue, they've never really put their stuff onto YouTube before, they're not getting any commissions from in, in the re- from the regular broadcasters. What are the new skill sets that they need to learn in terms of pivoting their business and and starting to generate their own revenue? So I think in terms of how to understand how to kind of surface algorithmically on the platform, I think that's absolutely key because there's a vast amount of content going out on YouTube every second, like thousands of hours. It's just like an absolute abundance of content. So how do you get your stuff seen? So I think the first thing to do is is make sure when you're uploading it, is it in the right format and is it the right kind of content that people are, are looking for? And by format, it's like, am I trying to hit younger audiences that are using the short form one? Am I trying to reach certain like demographics by using the longer form content? How is it titled? How is it packaged? Because ultimately, the first thing you do is you do that and that kind of puts the video out to get impressions and that's getting hopefully in front of the right people. Once you've got in front of the right people, is it packaged correctly to draw them in? And the, and the number one thing they see is the thumbnail. The thumbnail is so, so valuable because it's the window into the video. Is it representative? Is it engaging enough for someone to say, yep, that's what I want? But also, is it representative enough so when they click it, it is what they wanted, what they thought the video was going to be? And we do lots of tests on what is the kind of impact on click-through rates. And one of my favorite tests, one of my team did, was what impact facial expressions have on click-through rates. Mouth open, mouth closed, you know, surprise, stuff like that. Mouth open had a 10% higher click-through rate. Yeah, which is why you see Mr. Beast looking... Shocked you know, and, ah, uh, yeah, and like I mean, high it's... contrast and the whites of his eyes. Yeah, he has a team of six people that make th- nothing but thumbnails. So like it, that's so important on that click-through rate. But then also, once you've got it through, the rep- uh, is it representative of the content? Because then it's retention. If people click through and they bounce, then they know it's a, then YouTube's algorithm will go. That's it's a like video, clickbait, right, exactly. Essentially, yeah. Yeah. So that will keep them. You know, if they stay around for long enough and the average view duration or retention is is decent, then what will happen is the next time you upload a video, YouTube will go. Well, we put it in front of these people. They clicked it. They stuck around. So this is the kind of content they want. Let's serve it again. And then you start building momentum, momentum, momentum. And I think the key thing to remember is like writing titles almost like you are a magazine article title, that kind of thing. It's like, what is telling the story in a very short amount of time that's compelling and engaging, makes people want to know more, but like is concise enough that it doesn't roll off the screen and they, you know, they're not seeing what it is. So I think that's really important. The thumbnail is in- exciting and engaging and people want to click on it. But then also the content is what they're after, you know, and, and I think metadata being, you know, making sure you're hitting the kind of core points of the video, but, you know, reaching the kind of pockets of interest that you're trying to, to achieve. So those types of things constantly, constantly checking those things will help kind of improve the overall video. And then as a result, channel performance. But one of the other things to do is go back and check, you know, like if you've had a video that's underperformed, but you know that this is good content, but no one's engaging with it. 
well, something's not quite right. Either your thumbnail's not cut up to scratch or your title doesn't quite grab or, or you've kind of been a bit lazy on the tags. Like, it's, it's not a set and forget. Like we constantly will go back and audit stuff from a year ago. Like we, we have whole teams dedicated to kind of checking historic performance and how do we refresh that. But I think if you're starting a channel yourself, like it's just making sure the videos from the previous weeks, you're just keeping an eye on them and what is the little tweaks I can do. And I think just knowing that it, there's a kind of a kind of almost like a gardening nature to it, you've got to kind of keep checking, tending, tending to it. That's it. Yeah. Tending to the older stuff as well as focusing on the new. I think this is really important. Yeah. And that's something that I've learned. You don't just bung stuff up there and forget it and expect the, the algorithm to do its magic. You know, you do need to learn and just mm. check and, and, and data, you know, is something that YouTube gives you an enormous amount of, right? I mean, out of all the social platforms, the quality and the depth of data that, that it gives you is, is amazing. And so, you know, the, the ability to interpret that in the right way is super important, right? So again, you know, in terms of a skill that a producer is going to need, we hear, we hear about data scientists and, and, you know, people with very, very fancy names when it comes to data. But, you know, is, is a, a rudimentary interest and knowledge of data and how to interpret it important for a, for a content creator? Yes, I think that I really nerd out about it and i i've been working on youtube for over 10 years and i just find it fascinating that you can drill down into all sorts of information like view durations where the drop off where the peak of interest where the people rewind and rewatch you know so ultimately like a really kind of crude example is if you've got a long form video but you want to make clips you can literally go into the video and see where's the most interesting part in terms of what people are rewatching and highest in terms of like percentage of interest so those are the types of things you're going to right well that's that will be obviously be my clip you don't even need to watch the content to kind of find what is the most engaging part of it so there's elements like that there is obviously metadata and the way in which it kind of pulls people in but i just find it fascinating that you can get so many different types of information from it and again it can be overwhelming but i think the key thing is trying to understand what's the stuff that matters so if your kpr is marketing and and like audience engagement well then that's the stuff you can look at what is the kind of number of comments what are the likes what's the likes to dislikes ratio what's the demographics where are they watching it you know being on being able to kind of visualize that and see it and kind of pull that into your strategy i think is is crucial so i'm aware that like i'm saying you, know, you need to know how to do <laughs> graphic design and understand data and all of these it can be a bit overwhelming but i think the kind of core thing is throw yourself into it and you'll be amazed at how much you quickly pick up by just being in the the analytics constantly and just looking at the stuff and and there in, is plenty of help out there as well aren't there? there are actually youtube channels dedicated to helping you learn about mm. the algorithm and you know how important chapters are for example in your content and and all the rest of it so there's there are lots of tools out there for you to be able to upskill yourself or obviously you can work with a company like yours who can you know who can help you do that let's talk about monetization then which is the thing that's going to be most Thing important to producers who are looking to pivot and uh, maybe change their business to be a bit more self-sustaining going forward. Tell us about the the roadmap to making money on YouTube. So we've got our uh, our factual producer with a catalogue of uh, content that's uh, that's actually you know, sat there on servers. They need to generate a certain number of followers before YouTube will start monetizing their content. In terms of a barrier to monetization, YouTube is definitely the fastest to kind of get there. I know with Meta, you have to have over 10,000 uh, fans on a page, and I can't remember what the watch time is. They've increased it. But yes, you need to get past these thresholds. And, and understandably, it's, it's to stop people from farming it out and automating it and just making money off of yeah. crap, essentially. But with YouTube... Once you've got your kind of AdSense account set up, you can start monetizing it. In terms of different monetizational products, like Reels, I'd say Shorts does monetize, but a very low, whereas the longer form is much higher. Anything over eight minutes, you can have a mid-roll in. So if you've got a, a video that's seven minutes and 59 seconds, literally just add some blank space at the end. Like that extra, just getting it over the eight minute mark, like will get you to the mid-roll point and can help you double the kind of revenue that you can generate from it. But it's also in, important to know that especially if you're, you know, anyone that's creating content really cares about the narrative of it. It's not just necessarily filling it with adverts. You can place the adverts in the mid-rolls once you get past that point to make sure it doesn't disrupt the story or or narrative or anything like that so i think that yeah the kind of core 
thing for monetization. If you if that's the the, the core KPI, then definitely longer is better. But yeah, kind of building that kind of retained audience. So when they stick there, they stick around. And you don't need to necessarily rely on um, on those ads. You can actually sell your own sponsorship as well, can't you? Yeah. So th- there's there's other ways of making money. So there's there's sponsorships, which is one where actually it's a bit like Patreon, where people can pay a monthly monthly fee to, to to be a member, like member of your channel. Sorry. And then with that, with the memberships, not sponsorships, memberships they can get access to behind the scenes stuff and, and stuff like that. So that, I would say it's more kind of creator focused than it is necessarily like a IP or a TV show. You can also do direct ad selling where you, as well as Google AdSense sold inventory, there is direct sold inventory. That's quite difficult to set up. Like we've been going kind of 12 years and, and we've been uh, doing direct ad sales for I think four or five, but it's, it's, it's not that's not freely available to everyone. You have to have a direct ad sales license. So you can do that, but that's a way of selling at a much higher rate card than Google. And then there's sponsorships, which is where we've worked with some partners where there'll be a brand wants to do a buyout of a channel, kind of sponsor their banner and the, have clickable links in the descriptions, and then also buy the inventory around it. And in some instances, we've had channels make more from a three-month sponsorship than a year's worth of AdSense revenue. Right. So let's talk a little bit about some case studies then, some examples of how IP owners or broadcasters within the TV industry have gone on to have real success within YouTube. Can you give us a few examples? Of yeah, that? I think like one of the difficulties I have is because we're white label, I, I can't freely talk about all of the ones that I'd love to talk about. But a few that I can talk about is, so we worked with the Graham Norton Show for over 11 years and uh, we launched the channel on YouTube and uh, it's been a phenomenal success. Um, and it started out very short clips and then we were able to kind of make longer compilations. One of the fu- really fun things we did with that is obviously when the show's on air, it's Hollywood stars and it's all relevant and it's culturally part of the conversation. But often there would be shows or films coming up that, we might not necessarily have access or the show might not even be on air when the Game of Thrones is about to, you know, the new series of Game of Thrones or whatever the show might be. But all of those stars have been on the show. So we can make a best of Game of Thrones compilation or, you know, with Top Gun Maverick coming out where then every time uh, Tom Cruise has been on the show and those types of things. So you can make thematic compilations from historic content that is culturally relevant now and it becomes part of the zeitgeist, part of the conversation. And then before you know it, it's on the mail online and it's being shared. And, you know, it becomes, it builds its real momentum, becomes tied to the current cultural event from the historic content. So that's been a real pleasure to kind of do that. And we've, we've managed to do that across kind of all platforms. And, and yeah. Well, you, you've done a great job because you can't get away from it. Every time you pick up your phone, it's Graham Norton, then. Yeah, no, that, that's been a really, really fun project to work on. One of the ones where I can't name the the title, but I'll just say for a US studio had a 90s sitcom that isn't Friends, it definitely isn't Friends, but it was about a, the the protagonist in it was, it was like her fashion was a kind of core part of the show. And what was really interesting is, again, it's a sitcom that Gen Z and Gen Alpha never would have like watched when they weren't alive when it was on air. But 90s fashion is relevant. So actually we lent heavily into the 90s fashion aspect of it. And it became so popular on TikTok and other, you know, and, and YouTube and all of those that the star started making original content for us because it's gathered such momentum and resonated so much with Gen Z audiences that never in a million years would have searched for this show or would have been engaged with it or really cared about the storylines or anything like that. So we packaged it in a way that we really kind of just went all in on younger audiences and it, and it really paid dividends. Another one of that is, so we work with Gordon Ramsay and all of his, for want of a better expression, the Gordon-verse of all his different channels and one of them is Kitchen Nightmares and that YouTube channel is very, very meme centric. Like we have made compilations that honestly, some of the comments are like, has this person gone insane? Like it's very funny, but it's just so different from the original kind of tone of voice of when it was originally on air. But it's, you know, there was a whole story about Chef Mike, who is a microwave that Gordon threw out of a window one episode. And it was just long, forlorn violin playing over the shots of the mic and the mic microwave in the background so like really kind of fun ways to play with it and repackage something in a in a new way and find new audiences and, and people kind of engaging with it in a different different way completely so there are a few kind of examples of how we've managed to make archive stuff relevant in terms of other success stories i kind of mentioned earlier new dominion which is a kind of true crime series and the way in which we kind of package those with certain cases around states and certain crimes stuff like that I, like 
like our client said to us, it's like we've reached a completely different audience. We've managed to completely like sell the tapes to new territories that we never kind of had success with before because of the success we've seen on social. Ah, so you're saying that actually YouTube success internationally has actually helped linear sales and yeah. had a really big impact on... on yeah, we, we've seen it like four or five times. One of them was in Italy, another kind of uh, 90s sitcom where we we ran not just the English language version, but Spanish and Italian language YouTube channels. And the success of the Italian language YouTube channel was then taken as a sales tactic for, from their international sales team to an Italian broadcaster and they, they bought it. So it was one of those that that's been a fantastic one. Another one was a kids show that we were doing 14 different languages. The South Korean one absolutely blew up and was much more successful than they expected. And as a result, they used that as part of the negotiation for when they resold in South Korea because they knew actually this was far bigger than they were led to believe. So they, whilst most of the time the YouTube strategy is dedicated to how do we build the audience there, it is something that can be utilised and weaponised for international sales. Interesting. James, thank you so much for coming on Telecast. It was really fascinating. And we're going to be speaking to a number of your colleagues over the next few weeks with some really more in-depth practical tips of how to succeed on YouTube. Um, If you could leave us with one tip for that reticent TV producer who's got that great catalogue and he's wondering about, you know, does he have the skills or, you know, how he or she might enter the world of YouTube, what, what would your tip be? I would say embrace it and experiment. There's... Like, you're not going to learn anything by being too cautious and not doing anything. I think even just throwing yourself into it and trying to see if you can build a channel or if you can reach an audience, because quite a lot of what we've found was just through experimentation and uh, evolution. Like, we've been doing it for 12 years, so we're quite well-versed in it. But when we started out, we we didn't really know what we were doing. We did it by kind of, let's let's just experiment, let's try it out, and and learning from those successes. The success, like we see in the FA will inform our strategy for a kid's title, which will inform our strategy for a chat show. So like all of these things, they feed into each other, but we do it by experimenting and really playing with it. And I think one of the other things about it is it's really fun. Like it's actually a really fun platform. It is. I have to, I have to agree that YouTube studio is the most addictive thing that I've been on in the internet because you can get, I mean, it sounds really nerdy, but you can, and you can get really obsessive about it. But when you start to, change things like your you know your your uh, thumbnails or your tags and you actually see an immediate uplift it's like oh god i've got to go r- across all of my videos now and do the same things it is super rewarding when you see the little tweaks and changes that you can make and how much of a difference that makes yeah and i think one of the key things is it's like you can just find your tone of voice and be authentic. Like whilst I was talking earlier about some of them being like Mimi and aiming for Gen Z, doesn't suit everyone. Like we've got other channels where we're, you know, the average viewer age is plus 65. And it's like, understand your audience, be authentic to your tone of voice and just and just have fun with it, really. And it reminds me of when I first spoke to Sam Barcroft years ago. And Sam was actually originally using YouTube as a shop window for normal content licensing. And he found that the content that he was actually placing on YouTube was blowing up and going incredibly viral. So it's still about test and learn, isn't it? It's still about, you know, seeing how an audiences are reacting and that might take you in different directions when you see the opportunity present itself. Yeah, and I do think that, like, the best, the kind of recommendation around best practices won't be the same recommendation for best practices in six months' time. The algorithm changes, audience behaviours change, trends change, tastes change. It's it's a constantly evolving platform, which both is challenging, but also the fun of it. You know, like stuff evolves and and, and viral things happen and, and they, they create trends and create behaviours and, and just kind of embrace it, kind of keep your finger on the pulse, see what's happening. And also if something blows up, well, then investigate why. Find out why. Lean into it. Find out what's what kind of... It, it shouldn't just be a potluck. Like, investigate it, figure out what the success is and, and replicate it. All right, good advice. James, thank you so much for coming on Telecast. Thanks for having me. Well, that's about it for this week's show. Telecast was produced by Spirit Studios and recorded in London. My guest next week is Dan Taylor-Watt, media and AI consultant and former director of product the BBC iPlayer and BBC Sounds, as we discuss the latest developments on AI-powered text-to-image and text-to-video tools on the market today. Don't forget to subscribe to Telecast on YouTube. You can find a link in the episode description or just search for Telecast TV on YouTube 
and hit subscribe. Until then, stay safe.